from around the globe. It's the Cube, presenting innovation for good. Brought to you by Onshape. Hello everyone and welcome to Innovation for Good, a program hosted by the Cube and brought to you by Onshape, which is a PTC company. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm coming to you from our studios outside of Boston. I'll be directing the conversations today. It's a very exciting all live program. We're going to look at how product innovation has evolved and where it's going and how engineers, entrepreneurs, and educators are applying cutting edge, cutting edge product development techniques and technology to change our world. You know, the pandemic has of course profoundly impacted society and altered how individuals and organizations are going to be thinking about and approaching the coming decade. Leading technologists, engineers, product developers, and educators have responded to the new challenges that we're facing from creating life-saving products to helping students learn from home to how to apply the latest product development techniques and solve the world's hardest problems. And, and in this program, you'll hear from some of the world's leading experts and practitioners on how product development and continuous innovation has evolved, how it's being applied to posit positively affect society, and importantly, where it's going in the coming decade. So let's get started with our first session, Fueling Tech for Good. And with me is John Hirschdick, who is the president of the Software as a Service Division of PTC, which acquired Onshape just over a year ago, where John was the CEO and co-founder. And Dana Grayson is here. She's the co-founder and general partner at Construct Capital, a new venture capital firm. Folks, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to be here, Dave. Thanks All right, for John. having me. You're very welcome, Dana. Well, look, John, let's get into it. For, first, a belated congratulations on the acquisition of, of Onshape. That was an awesome seven year journey for your company. Tell our audience a little bit about the story of Onshape. You know, take us back to day zero. Why did you and your co-founders start Onshape? Well, I'll actually start before Onshape and let you know, Dave, I've been in this business for almost 40 years, the business of building mm -hmm. software tools for product developers. And I had been part of some previous products in the industry and companies that had been in their era, big changes in this market. And about, um, you know, in the, a little before founding Onshape, we started to see the problems uh, product development teams were having with the traditional tools of that era years ago. And we saw the opportunity presented by cloud web and mobile technology. And we said, hey, we could use cloud web and mobile to solve the problems of product developers, make their their uh, businesses run better, but we'd have to build an entirely new system, an entirely new company to do it. And that's what Onshape's about. Well, so notwithstanding the challenges of, of COVID and the difficulties this year, how, how's the first year uh, been as a, a division of PTC for you guys? How's business? Anything you can share with us? Yeah, our first year at PTC has been awesome. It's been, uh, you know, when you get acquired, Dave, you never, you know, you, you have great optimism, but you never know what life will really be like. It's sort of like getting married or something, you know, until you're really doing it, you don't know. And so I'm happy to say that one year into our acquisition um, at PTC, Onshape is thriving. It's worked out better than I could have imagined a year ago along all ways. I mean, uh, sales are up um, in Q4. Our new sales rate grew 80% versus, excuse me, our fiscal Q4, Q3 in the calendar year. It grew 80% compared to the year before. Our educational use is skyrocketing with around 400% growth, most recently year to year of students and teachers in COVID. And we've launched a major cloud platform using the core of Onshape technology called Atlas. So um, just tons of exciting things going on um, at PTC. That's awesome. And thank you for sharing some of those metrics. And of course, you're a very humble individual. You know, people should know a little bit more about you. You, you mentioned, you know, we founded SolidWorks co-founded SolidWorks, yeah. actually founded SolidWorks. You had a great exit in the, in the late nineties, but what I really appreciate is, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you've got a passion for the babies that you, you helped birth. You stayed with the Salt yeah. Systems uh, for a number of years, the company that acquired SolidWorks well yeah. over a decade. And, yeah. and of course you and I have talked about how you participated in the, the MIT blackjack team, you know, back in the day. So yeah. you're, as I say, you're, you're very understated for somebody who well, is uh, so accomplished. So thank well, you. Well, that's kind to of you, but I tend to, I tend to um, always keep my eye more on what's ahead, you know, what's next then. And, you know, I look back sure to enjoy it and uh, learn from it, 
about what I can put to work, making new memories, making new successes. I love it. Okay, let's bring Dana into the conversation. Uh, hello, Dana. And you look, you were a fairly early investor in, in Onshape when you were with NEA. And, and I think it was like it was a Series B, but it was very right close after the A raise. And, and you were and still are a big believer in industrial transformation. So what, take us back. What did you see about Onshape back then that, that excited you? Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, I was lucky to be an early investor in Onshape. You know, the things that actually attracted me to Onshape were largely around John and, and uh, the team there really setting out to do something, as John says, humbly, something totally new, but really building off of their background was a large part of it. Um, but, you know, I was really intrigued by the design collaboration side of the product. Um, I would say that's, frankly, what originally attracted me to it. What kept me in the room, you know, in terms of the industrial world was seeing just if you start with collaboration around design, what that does to the overall industrial product life cycle, um, accelerating manufacturing, just, you know, modernizing all the manufacturing, just starting with design. So I'm really thankful to the Onshape guys because it was one of the first investments I made that turned me on to the whole sector. And oh. wow, just such a great pleasure to work with, um, with John and the whole team there and now see what they're doing inside PTC. And, and you just launched Construct Capital this year, right in the middle of a pandemic, and, and which is awesome. I love it. And you're focused on early stage investing. Maybe tell us a little bit about Construct, Construct Capital, what your investment thesis is, and you know, what are the big waves that, that you're hoping to ride? Sure. Um, at Construct, it, it is literally lifting out of NEA what I was doing there. Um, after Onshape, I went on to invest in companies such as Desktop Metal and Tulip, to name a couple of them. Form Labs is another one right. in and around the manufacturing space. But our thesis at Construct is broader than just you know manufacturing and industrial. It really incorporates all of what we'd call foundational industries that have let, yet to be fully tech enabled or digitized. Uh, manufacturing is a big piece of it. Supply chain, logistics, transportation, and mobility are, not, are other big pieces of it. And together, they really drive you know half of the GDP in the U.S. and have been very underinvested and frankly haven't attracted really great founders like John in droves. And I think that's going to change. We're seeing um, entrepreneurs coming out of the tech world orthogonally into these industries and then bringing them back into the tech world, which is which is something that needs to happen. So John and team were certainly early pioneers. And I think, you know, frankly, obviously that voting with my feet that the next set of really strong companies um, are going to come out of this space over the next decade. I think there's a huge opportunity to digitize these sort of tr traditionally non-digital you know, organizations. But Dana, you focused, I think it's, it's accurate to say you focused on even more early stage investing now. And I want to understand why you feel it's important to be early. I mean, it's obviously riskier and rewardier. Uh, but what do you look for in, in companies and, and founders like John? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there are different styles of investing all the way up to public market investing. I've always been an early stage investor. So I like to work with founders and teams when they're, you know, just starting out. Um, I happen to also think that we're just really early in the whole digital transformation of this world. You know, John and the team have been, you know, back from SolidWorks, et cetera, around the space for a long time. But again, the downstream impact of what they're doing um, really changes the whole industry. And, and so we're pretty early in, in digitally transforming that market. Um, so that's another reason why I want to invest early now, um, because I do really firmly believe that the next set of strong companies and strong returns for my own investors will be in these spaces. Um, you know, what I look for in founders, are people that really see the world a different way. And, you know, sometimes some people think of founders or entrepreneurs as being very risk seeking. You know, if you ask John probably and, and other successful entrepreneurs, they would call themselves sort of risk averse because by the time they start the company, they really have isolated all the risk out of it and think that they have the, given their expertise or what they're seeing, they're just so compelled to go change something. Um, so I look for that type of attitude, experience. Um, as you can also tell from John, he's fairly humble. So humility and just focus is also really important. Um, 
that those are that's a lot of it, frankly. Excellent. Just the yeah, thank you. And, and, and John, you've got such a rich history in this space. Uh, and, and I wonder if you could sort of connect the dots over time. I mean, when you look back, what were the major forces that you saw in the market in, in the early days, uh, particularly early days of Onshape? Uh, and, and how has that evolved and what are you seeing today? Well, I think I, I touched on it earlier. For, actually, can I just reflect on what Dana said about yeah, risk absolutely. taking for just a quick one and say, throughout my life from blackjack to starting SolidWorks to Onshape, it's about taking calculated risks. Yes, you try to eliminate the risks as much as you can, but I always say, I don't mind taking a risk that I'm aware of and I've calculated through as best I can. I don't like taking risks that I don't know I'm taking. <laughs> That's really yeah, yeah. bothersome. You like to bet on sure so, things yeah. as much as you can. Well, yeah. sure things, or at least where you feel you've you've done the research and you see them and you know they're there and you you know you 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 keep that in mind in the room and I think that's great. And Dana did so much for us. Uh, Dana, I want to thank you again for all that you did at every step of the way from where we started to to you know your journey with us ended formally but continues informally now back to you um dave i think question about the opportunity and how it's shaped up well i think i touched on it earlier when i said it's about helping product developers you know our customers are the people who build the future of manufactured goods anything you think of that would be manufactured in a factory you know the chair you're sitting in machine that made your coffee you know the the computer you're using the trucks that drive by on the street all the COVID product research, the equipment being used to make vaccines, all that stuff is designed by someone. And our job is to give them the tools to do it better. And I could see the problems that those product developers had that were slowing them down with using the computing systems of the time. When we built SolidWorks, that was almost 30 years ago. And you know, people don't realize that it was in the early 90s. And you know, we did the best we could for the early 90s but what we did, we didn't anticipate the, the world of today. And so people were having problems with just installing the systems. Dave, you wouldn't believe how hard it is to install these systems. You need to spec up a special Windows computer, you know, and make sure you've got all the memory and graphics you need. And you need to get that set up. You need to make sure the device drivers are right, install a big piece of software, a license key. I'm not making this up. They're still around. You may not even know what those are. You know, Dana's laughing because, you know, zero cool people do things like this anymore. Um, and it only runs on Windows. You want a second user to use it. They need a copy. They need a code. Are they on the same version? It's a nightmare. The teams change. You know, you just say, well, get everyone on the software. Well, who's everyone? You know, you got a new vendor today, a new customer tomorrow, a new employee. People come on and off the team. The other problem was the data stored in files, thousands of files. This isn't like a spreadsheet or word processor where there's one file to pass around. These are thousands of files to make one, even a simple product. People were tearing their hair out. John, what do we do? I've got copies everywhere. I don't know where the latest version is. We tried like you know locking people out so that only one person can change it at a time. That works against speed, it works against innovation. We saw what was happening with cloud, web, and mobile. So what's happened in the years since is every one of the forces that product developers experience, the need for speed, the need for innovation, the need to be more efficient with their people and their capital resources, every one of those trends have been amplified since we started Onshape by a lot of forces in the world and COVID has amplified all those. The need for agility and remote work COVID has amplified all that. At the same time, the acceptance of cloud, you know, a few years ago, people were like, cloud, uh, you know, how's that going to work? And now they're saying to me, you know, increasingly, how would you ever even have done this without the cloud? How do you make SolidWorks work without the cloud? How would that even happen? Well, you, know, you know, once people understand what Onshape's about, and we're the only full SaaS solution, software as a service, full SaaS solution in our industry. So what's happened in those years? Same problems we saw earlier, but turn up the gain, they're bigger problems. And with cloud, we've seen skepticism of years ago turn into acceptance and now even embracement in the COVID-driven new normal. Yeah, so a lot of friction in the previous environment. So cloud, cloud yeah. obviously a huge factor. Uh, and I guess, I guess Dana, John could see it coming, you know, in the early days of SolidWorks with, you know, you had Salesforce, which is kind of the, uh, first major independent SaaS player. Well, I guess that was late '90s, so it was post uh, SolidWorks, but 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 pre Onshape. And you know, Workday was 
you know, pre Onshape in the mid 2000s. And, and, but, but, you know, the bet was on the SaaS model was right for CAD and, and product development, you know, which maybe at the time wasn't a no brainer or maybe it was, I, I, I don't know, but, but Dana, is there, is there anything that you would invest in today that's not cloud-based? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think we still see things all the time in the manufacturing um, world that are not cloud-based. And I think, you know, the closer you get to the shop floor and the production environment, um, I, I think John and the PTC folks would agree with this too, but that it's, you know, there's reliability requirements, there's performance requirements, there's still this attitude of, you know, don't touch the printing press. So the cloud is still a little bit scary sometimes. And um, I think hybrid cloud is a real thing for those or on-premise solutions in some cases is still a real thing. What what we're more focused on, and um, despite whether it's on-premise or hybrid or, or SaaS and cloud, is a frictionless go-to-market model um, in the companies we invest in. So SaaS and cloud are really make that easy to adopt um, for new users, you know, sign up, start using a product. Um, but whether it's hosted in the cloud and whether it's SaaS, you can still distribute buying power. And um, I would, I'm just encouraging customers in the customer world and the more industrial environment to entrust some of their lower level engineers with more budget discretionary spending so that they can try more products and unlock innovation. Right, the unit economics are so compelling. So let's bring it, you know, to, to today's, you know, situation, John. You decided to exit about a year ago. You know, what did you see in PTC other than the obvious money? What was the strategic fit? Yeah, well, Dave, I want to be clear. I didn't exit anything really. You know, I, <laughs> I love doing it. it. I don't like that term exit. I mean, Dana had to exit as a shareholder, and so it's not a, it's not an exit for me. It's just a step in the journey. Um, what we saw in PTC was a partner, first of all, that shared our vision from the top down at PTC, Jim Heppelman, the CEO. He had a great vision for, for the impact that SaaS can make based on cloud technology. And really, as Dana highlighted so much, it's not just the technology, it's how you go to market and the whole business being run and how you support and make the customer successful. So Jim shared a vision for the potential and really really um, said, hey, come come join us and we can do this bigger, better, faster. We expanded the vision really to include this Atlas platform for hosting other SaaS applications at PTC. I mean, Dave, the day I arrived at PTC, I met the head of the academic program. He came over to me and I, I said, you know, and, and how many people are on your team? I thought he'd say five, 40 people on the PTC academic team. It was amazing to me because, you know, we were, we were just near about a hundred people when we were acquiring our total company. We didn't even have a dedicated academic team. And we had a lot of students signing up, you know, thousands and thousands. Well, now we have hundreds of thousands of students. We're approaching a million users. And that shows you the power of this team that PTC had combined with our product and technology. Boom, you get a big success for us and for the teachers and students of the world. We're giving them great tools. So so many good things. We're also putting some PTC technology from other parts of PTC back into um, on shape one area, a little spoiler, a little sneak peek, working on taking generative design. Dana knows all about generative design. We couldn't acquire that technology. We were a startup, you know, just too, too much to, to, to do, but PTC owns one of the best in the business. This frustrum technology, we're working on putting that into on shape and our customers um, we'll be happy to see it hopefully in the coming year sometime. Nice, great to see that two-way exchange. Yeah. Now you both know very well when you start a company, it's of course a very exciting time. You don't have a lot of baggage, you know, our customers pulling you in a lot of different directions and Correct. asking you for specials. You get this kind yep. of clean slate, so to speak. And I would think in many ways, John, despite, you know, your install base, you have a bit of that dynamic occurring today, especially, you know, driven by the forced march to digital transformation that COVID caused. So when you sit down with the team at, at PTC and talk strategy, you now have you know, more global resources, you got co cohort selling opportunities. You, you know, you know, we, you know, what's the conversation like in, in terms of where you want to take the division? 
Well, Dave, you, you actually, you, it sounds like we should have you coming in and talking to us about strategy because you've got the strategy down. I mean, we're doing everything you said, global expansion, we're able to reach across selling. We've got some excellent PTC customers that we can reach, reach now and they're finding uses for Onshape. I think the plan is to, you know, just grow, go, go, go and grow, grow, grow. We're, we're looking for this year, priorities are expand the product. I mentioned the breadth of the product with new things. PTC did recently another technology that they acquired for Onshape. We did an acquisition. It was it was uh, small. It wasn't widely announced in, um, in an area related to interfacing with electrical CAD systems. So so we're doing we're 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 expanding the breadth of Onshape. We're going more depth in the areas we're already in. We have enormous opportunity to add more features and functions. That's in the product go to market. You mentioned it global global presence. That's something we were a little um, light on a year ago. Now we have a team, Dana may not even know it. We have an on-shape dedicated team in Barcelona, based in Barcelona, but throughout Europe, we're doing multiple languages. Um, the, the academic program just introduced a new product into that space that's, that's even fueling more success and growth there. Um, and of course, continuing to, to invest in customer success and this Atlas platform story I keep mentioning we're going to soon have um, we're going to soon have four other major PTC brands shipping products on our Atlas SaaS platform, and so we're really excited about that. That's good for the other PTC products. It's also good for Onshape because now there's 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 other interesting products that our Onshape customers can use, take advantage of very easily using, say, a common login conventions about user experience they're used to invest of all their SaaS based so they that makes it easier to begin with so that's some of the exciting things going on i think you'll see ptc um, expanding our lead in SaaS based applications for this sector for our um our target uh sectors not just in um in cad and data management but another area of ptc's big in is augmented reality uh, with the Vuforia product line leader in industrial uses of AR. That's a whole nother story. We should do a whole nother show on yeah, yeah. augmented reality. Very but cool. These products are amazing. You can you can um, help factory workers, people on the, you know, the people who are left out of the digital transformation sometimes who are standing in front of a machine all day. They, they can't be sitting like we are doing Zoom. They can wear an AR headset and our tools let them create great content. This is an area Dana's invested in, in other companies. But what I wanted to note is the new releases of our authoring software for this AR content getting released this month, use through the Atlas platform, the SaaS components of Onshape for things like uh, revision management and collaboration um, and uh, 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 workflow activity. All that, those are tools that we're able to share, leverage, we get a lot of synergy. It's just really good. It's really fun too. We're having a good time doing That's it. That's awesome. And then we're going to be talking to John McElhinney later about Atlas and do a little deeper dive on that. And Dana, what is your involvement today with, with Onshape? Are you looking for, you know, which, which of their customers are actually adopting and are going to disrupt their industries? Are you going to get good pipeline from that? Or how do you collaborate today? That sounds like a great idea. Um, <laughs> As John will tell you, I'm constantly just asking him for advice and impressions of other entrepreneurs and uh, picking his brain on ideas. No formal relationship, clearly, but um, continue to count John and and John and <laughs> other people at Onshape in in the circle of experts that I rely on for their opinions. Yeah. All right. So, so we have some questions from the crowd here. Um, I, I, one, of, one of the questions is for the Dream Team. You know, John and Dana, what's your next next collective venture? I, I don't think we're there yet, are we? <laughs> no, I just say, as Dana said, we love talking to her about, you know, Dana, you just returned a compliment. We would try and give you advice on the deals you're looking at. And I'm sort of casually mentoring at least one of your portfolio entrepreneurs. And that's been a lot of fun for me um, and hopefully of value to them. But um, also, Dana, we you're, you're an important pipeline to us in the world of some new things that are happening that we wouldn't see if uh, you know you've shown us some things that you've said. What do you think of this business? And for us, it's like wow, it's cool to see that's going on, and that's what's supposed to work in an ecosystem like this. So we we deeply value the ongoing relationship, 
and no, we're not starting something new. I got a lot of work left to do with what I'm doing and really happy, but we can, we can uh, collaborate in this way on other ventures. I like this question too. Somebody's asking with cloud options like Onshape, will more students have STEM opportunities? So, so that's a great question. Are, are you, because of, of SAS and cloud, are you able to reach you know, more students much more cost effectively? Yeah, I, I, Dave, I'm so glad that, that, um, that I was asked about this because yes, and it's extremely gratifying to us. Yes, we are because of cloud, because Onshape is, is the only full cloud, full SAS system or industry, we're able to reach STEM edu education, we're bring, able to be part of bringing STEM education to students who couldn't get it otherwise. And one of the most gratif gratifying things to me is the, the um, emails we're getting from teachers um, that, that really, um, uh, and the phone calls where they, they really pour their heart out, heart out and say, we're able to get to students in areas that have very limited compute resources that don't have an IT staff where, they, they don't know what computer the, the students can have at home and they probably don't even have a computer. We're talking about being able to teach STEM on a phone, Dave, an Android phone, a low-end Android phone. You can do wow. 3D modeling on there with Onshape. Now you can't do it in any other system, but with Onshape, you can do it. And so the teacher can say to the students, they have to have internet access. And I know there's a huge community that doesn't even have internet access and we're, we're not able, unfortunately, to help that. But if you have internet and you have even an Android phone, we can enable the educator to teach STEM. And so we have case after case of saving a STEM program or expanding it into the students that need it most is the ones we're helping here. So really excited about that. And we're also able to let, in addition to the, to the run, on, run on whatever computing devices they have, we also offer them the tools they need for remote teaching with a much richer experience. You know, could you teach SolidWorks remotely? Well, maybe if the student ran it and had a Windows workstation, you know, big, big high-end workstation, maybe you could, but it would be like the difference between collaborating with Onshape and collaborating with SolidWorks, like the difference between a Zoom video call and talking on the landline phone, <laughs> you know? It's right. a much richer experience and that's what you need in STEM. Teaching STEM is hard, so yeah, we're super, Super um, uh, excited about bringing STEM to more students because of cloud and SaaS. Yeah, and, and we're talking about innovation for good. And then the discussion, John, you just had, it really, it, it, there could be a whole nother vector here we could discuss on diversity. And I want to end with just pointing out, so Dana, you're a new firm. It's a woman-led firm, two, two women leaders, you know, going for it. So that's awesome to see. So yeah. really, yeah, yeah, thumbs up on that. Yeah, Congratulations we're, we're, on getting yeah. that off the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thanks you guys, really appreciate it. It was a great discussion. I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did as, as well. In a moment, we're gonna talk with Onshape customers to see how they're applying tech for good and some of the products that they're building. So keep it right there. I'm Dave Vellante, you're watching Innovation for Good on theCUBE, the global leader in digital tech event coverage. Stay right there.
from around the globe. It's theCUBE, presenting innovation for good. Brought to you by Onshape. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante and you're watching Innovation for Good, a program on Cube 365 made possible by Onshape, a PTC company. We're live today, Re real live TV, which is the heritage of the Cube. And now we're going to go to the sources and talk to Onshape customers to find out how they're applying technology to create real, real world innovations that are changing the world. And so let me introduce our, our panel members. Uh, Raphael gomez Sverberg is with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, a very big idea and collaborative nonprofit it was an initiative that was funded by Mark Zuckerberg and, and his wife, Priscilla Chan, and really around diagnosing and curing and better managing infectious diseases. So really timely topic. Philip Tabor is also joining us. He's with Silverside Detectors, which develops neutron detect detection systems. Yeah, you want to know if early if neutrons and radiation are in places where you don't want them. So this should be really interesting. And last but not least, Matthew Shields is with the Charlottesville Schools and is going to educate us on how he and his team are educating students in the use of modern engineering tools and techniques. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE and to the program. This should be really interesting. Thanks for coming on. Hi, our pleasure. For having us. All right, you're very welcome. Okay, let me ask each of you, uh, because you're all doing such interesting and compelling work. Let's start with Raphael. Tell us more about the Biohub and your role there, please. Yeah, so as you said, the Biohub is a nonprofit uh, research institution um, funded uh, by um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan. Um, and our main mission is to um, develop new technologies to help advance uh, medicine and uh, help hopefully cure and manage diseases. Um, we also have very close collaborations with the University of California, San Francisco, Stanford University, and the University of California, Berkeley. And we try to bring those universities together so they collaborate more on biomedical topics. And I uh, ma uh, manage a team of engineers, the bioengineering platform, um, and we're tasked with creating uh, instruments for the laboratory to help the scientists both inside the organization and also in the partner universities do their experiments in better ways or in ways that they couldn't do before. And this edition was launched, what, what five years ago? Uh, is that it was announced at the end of 2016 and we actually started operations at the beginning of 2017, which is when I joined. Um, so this is our uh, third year. And, and how's, it, how's it going? How's it work? I mean, uh, these things take time, uh, but- uh... It's, it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, the organization works beautifully. Um, it, it was amazing to see it grow from the beginning. I was employee number 12, I think. Uh, so when I came in, it was just an empty office building and empty labs. And very quickly we had something running that it's amazing. Um, so I'm very proud of, of the work that we have done um, to make that possible. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned now with COVID, um, we've been able to do a lot of very uh, cool work um, at the very beginning of the pandemic in March, uh, when there was a deficit of testing uh, capacity in California. Um, we spun up a uh, testing laboratory in record time in about a week. It was crazy. It was a crazy project, um, but, but incredibly satisfying. And uh, we ended up... Um, Running all the way until the beginning of November, when the lab was finally shut down, we could process about 3,000 samples a day. I think at the end of it all, we were able to test about 100, on the order of 150,000 samples wow. uh, from all over the state. We were providing free testing uh, to all of the Department of Public Health, Departments of Public Health in California, uh, which at the beginning of the pandemic had no way to do testing uh, affordably and, and fast. So I think that was a great service to the state. Now the state has created a testing uh, system uh, that would serve those departments. So then uh, we decided that it wasn't necessary to keep going with testing in the other biohub. So that was shut down. Great, um, thank you for that. Uh, now, now yeah. Philip, you, what you do is mind melting. Uh, you basically help keep the world safe. Maybe describe a little bit more about Silverside detectors and, and what your role is there and how it all works. Sure, so we make uh, nuclear bomb detectors and we also make water detectors. So we try and do our part to uh, keep the world from blowing up and make it a better place at the same time. And both of these applications use neutron radiation detectors. That's what we make. We put them out by a port, border crossing, places like that. They can help make sure that uh, people aren't smuggling, uh, shall we say, very bad things. 
Um, there's also a burgeoning field of research and application uh, where you can use neutrons uh, with some pretty cool physics to find water. So you can do things like put a detector up in the mountains and measure snowpack, uh, put it out in the middle of a field and measure soil moisture content. And as you might imagine, there are some really cool applications in uh, research and agronomy and public policy for this. All right, so it's okay. So it's it's much more than you know whatever fighting terrorism. It's a, there's a real edge or I, kind of IoT uh, application for what you guys do. Yeah, we do both. It's uh, swords to plowshares, you might say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. now, now, Matt, I I look at your role as kind of scaling the brain power for for the future. Maybe tell us more about Charlottesville Schools and and the mission that you're pursuing and what you do. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've been in Charlottesville City Schools for uh, about 11 or 12 years. I started there teaching um, a handful of classes, math and science and um, things like that. But um, the school board and my administration had the crazy idea of starting an engineering program about seven years ago. My background is in engineering, it is in engineering. My master's is in mechanical and aerospace engineering. and um, I basically spent a summer kind of coming up with what might be a, a fun engineering curriculum for our students. And it started with just me and 30 students about seven years ago, um, kind of a homespun from scratch curriculum. And one of my goals uh, from the outset was to be a completely project-based curriculum. And it's now grown. Um, we probably have about six or 700 students, five or six full-time teachers. We now have pre-engineering going on at the fifth and sixth grade level. Uh, and I now have students graduating, uh, at, you know, graduating after senior year with like seven years of engineering under their belt and heading off to doing some pretty cool stuff. So it's, it's been a lot of fun um, building up a program and, um, and, and learning a lot in the process. That's awesome. I mean, you know, the Cube is, we've been passionate about uh, things like women in tech, uh, uh, diversity, STEM. You know, not only do we need more, more students in STEM, we need more uh, underrepresented women, minorities, et cetera. And we were just talking to John Hirschdeck and Dana Gray Grayson about this is, it, it, do, you, do you feel as though you're, I mean, first of all, the work that you do is awesome, but, but I'll go one step further. Do you feel as though it's reaching a more you know, diverse base and, and how is that going? That's a great question. Um, I think research shows that a lot of people uh, get funneled into one kind of track or career path or set of uh, interests really early on in their educational career. And sometimes uh, that, that funnel is kind of artificial. And so that's one of the reasons we keep pushing back. Um, so our school system is introducing kindergartners to programming. Um, and so we're trying to push back how we expose students to engineering and to STEM fields as early as possible. And we've definitely seen the fruits of that in my program. In fact, my engineering program uh, sprung out of an after school and extracurricular science club that actually three girls started at our school. So I'm, I think that actually has helped that um, three girls started the, the club and that eventually is what led to our engineering program. So that's sort of baked into the DNA and also uh, our school is a, is a big public school and um, we have about 50% of the students are under the poverty line. And we, uh, I'm in Charlottesville, which is a big refugee town. And so I've been adamant from day one that there are no barriers to entry into the program. There's no test you have to take. You don't have to have be taking a certain level of math or anything like that. And that's been a lot of fun to have a really diverse set of kids enter the program and be successful. That's phenomenal. That's great to hear. So Philip, I want to come back to you. You know, I think about maybe someday we'll be able to go back to sporting events. And I know when I when I'm in there, there's somebody up on the roof looking out for me. Uh, you know, watching the crowd and and they have my back. And and I think in many ways the products that you build, you know, are similar. I may not know they're there, but they're they're keeping us safe or they're measuring things that 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 I don't necessarily see. But I, I wonder if you could talk about the, the a little bit more detail about the products you build and and how they're impacting society. Sure. So there are certainly a lot of people uh, Dave, who are who are watching, uh, trying to make sure uh, things are going well and keeping you safe that you may or may not be aware of, and, and we try and support uh, a lot of them. So we have detectors that are that are deployed uh, in a variety of uh, a variety of uses uh, with a number of agencies and governments that do uh, 
like I was saying, ports and border crossings, some other interesting applications that are looking for looking for signals that should not be there and uh, working closely to fit into the, the operations these folks do. Um, and we also have uh, a lot of outreach to researchers and scientists trying to help them support the work they're doing. Um, using neutron detection for soil moisture monitoring is a, some really cool opportunities for doing it at large scale and uh, with much less um, expense or complication than would have been done with previous technologies. Um, you know, they were talking about collaboration in the previous segment. Uh, we've been able to join a number of conferences for that virtually, including one that was supposed to be held in Boston, but another one that was held uh, out of the University of Heidelberg in, in Germany. And uh, this is sort of things that uh, in some ways the pandemic is pushing people towards greater collaboration than they wouldn't have been able to do had it all been in person. Yeah, we did uh, the Cube did live works a couple of years ago in Boston. It was an awesome show, and I think you know, with this whole trend toward digital, I call it the forced march to digital. Thanks to COVID, I, I think that's just going to continue to 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 grow. Uh, Raphael, I wonder if you could describe the process that you use to better understand diseases, and what's your organization's involvement been in more detail with addressing the the COVID pandemic. Um, so. So we have the, the, the BioHub is structured in, um, um, in a way that fosters so the combination of technology and science. So we have two scientific tracks, one about infectious diseases and the other one about understanding just basic human biology, how the human body functions and especially how the cells in the human body function and how they're organized to create the tissues in the body. Um, and then it has this set of platforms, um, mine is one of them, bioengineering, that are all technology related. So we have data science platform, uh, all about data analysis, machine learning, things like that. Um, we have a mass spectrometry platform is all about mass spectrometry technologies to, um, to exploit those ones in service for the scientist. And we have a genomics platform that is all about sequencing DNA and RNA. Um, and then an advanced microscopy. It's all about developing technologies. Uh, to look at things with uh, advanced microscopes and development technologies to uh, marry computation and microscopy. So um, the scientists set the agenda and the platforms we just serve their needs, uh, support their needs and hopefully develop technologies that help them do their experiments better and faster or allow them to do experiments that they couldn't do in any other way before. Um, and so with COVID, uh, because we have that very strong group of scientists that work on um, that have been working on infectious diseases before, and especially in viruses, uh, we've been able to very quickly pivot onto uh, working on that. Um, so for example, my team was able to build uh, pretty quickly um, a machine to automatically purify proteins, and it's being used to purify all these different important proteins in the COVID uh, virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and we're sending some of those purified proteins all over the world to scientists that are researching the virus and trying to figure out how to develop the vaccines, uh, understand how the virus affects the body and all that. Um, so some of the machines we, we built are having a very direct impact on this. Um, also for the COVID testing lab, we were able to very quickly uh, develop some very simple machines that allowed the lab to function sort of faster and more efficiently, sort of add a little bit of automation uh, in places where we couldn't find commercial machines that would do it. Um, Got it. Yeah. So Matt, I mean, you got to be listening to this and thinking about, okay, some, someday your students are going to be working at organizations like, like, like BioHub and Silverside. And, and, you know, a lot of young people, they're just, I don't know about you guys, but like my kids, they're really passionate about changing the world. You know, you know it's way more important than, you know, the, 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 the financial angles. And it's, 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 a, it's a, I, I got to believe you're seeing that, that you're right, right in the front lines there. Absolutely. Um, in fact, when I started the curriculum six or seven years ago, one of the first bits of feedback I got from my students is they said, okay, this is a lot of fun. So I had my students designing projects and programming microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and things like that. And um, the first bit of feedback I got from students was that they said, okay, when do we get to impact the world? I've heard engineering is about <laughs> making the world a better place and robots are fun and all, but you know, where's the real impact? And so, um, do. Yeah, thanks to the guidance of my students, um, I'm baking that more in now on like day one of engineering one, we talk about um, how the, the things that the tools that they're learning and the skills they're gaining uh, eventually 
you know, very soon can be, can be used to make the world a better place. You know, we, we all probably heard that famous line by uh, Jeff Hammerbacher, the greatest minds of my generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads. And I think we're, we're really, you know, gener gener generationally finally at the point where, you know, young students in engineering are really, you know, passionate about uh, affecting society. I want to get into the product, you know, side and understand how each of you are using on, on shape and, and the value that it, that it brings. Maybe Raphael, you can start. How long you've been using it? You know, what's your experience with it? Let, I, let's let's start there. I've been using it for about two years, and I switched to it with some trepidation. You know, I was used to always using the the the, the traditional product that you have to install on your computer that everybody uses. And so I was kind of locked into that. But I started being very frustrated with the the way it worked. Um, and decided to give Onship a chance um, with trepidation because any change always, you know, uh, causes anxiety. Um, but very quickly, my engineers started loving it uh, just because it's, it's uh, first of all, the, the learning curve wasn't very difficult at all. You can transfer from one from the traditional product to Onship very quickly and easily. You can learn all the concepts very, very fast. Uh, it has all the functionality that we needed. And, and what's best is that it allows to do things that we couldn't do before or we couldn't do easily. Um, now we can access the, 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 our CAT uh, documents from anywhere in the world. Um, so when we're in the lab um, fabricating something or testing a machine, any computer we have next to us or a tablet or an iPhone, we can pull it up and look at the CAD and check things or make changes. That's something that we couldn't do before because before you had to pay for every installation of the software for every computer and I couldn't afford to have 20 installations to have some computers with the CAD ready to use them like once every six months uh, would have been very inefficient. So we love that part. And the collaboration features are fantastic, uh, especially now with COVID that we have to have all the remote um, meetings. Uh, it's fantastic that you can have another person drive the CAD while the whole team is watching that person change the model and do things and point to things. Uh, that is absolutely revolutionary. We love it. Um, the fact that you have very, very sophisticated version control. Uh, before, it was always a challenge asking people, please, if you create any version in a part, how do we name it so that people find it? And then you end up with all these collection of files with names that nobody ever remembers what they are. The person left, and now nobody knows which version is the right one. A mess. With Onshape and the versioning system it has, and the fact that you can go back in history of the document and go back to previous versions so easily and then go back to the present version, and explore the history of the part, that is uh, truly um, just world changing for us uh, that we can do that so easily. And for me as a manager to manage this collection of information that is critical for our operations, it makes it so much easier because everything is in one place. I don't have to worry about file servers that go down that I have to administer, that I have to have IT taken care of that I have to figure out how to give access to people to those servers when they're at home and they need a virtual private network and all of that mess disappears. I just simply give a, give a person an account on Onshape and then magically they have access to everything in the way I want. And we can manage all our documents and everything in a way that is absolutely fantastic. Rafael, what, what, what were some of the concerns you had? You mentioned you had some trepidation. Was it the performance? Was it security? You know, some of the traditional cloud stuff. And I'm curious as to how, how, whether any of those were manifested, were they really that you had to manage? What were your concerns? Look, the main concern is how long is it going to take for everybody in the team to learn to use the system, like it and buy into it? Because I don't want to have my engineers using tools against their will, right? I want everybody to be happy because that's how they're, productive, they're happy right. and they enjoy the tools they have. Mm. Uh, that was my main concern. Uh, I was a little bit worried about the whole concept of not having the files in a place where I could quote unquote see it in some server in, on site, but that that's kind of an outdated concept, right? So that took a little bit of a mind shift, but very quickly, then I started thinking, look, I have a lot of documents on, on Google Drive. Like, I don't worry about that. Why would I worry about my cat on Unshape, right? It's the yeah. same thing. So. I just needed to sort of put things in perspective that way. Um, the other um, the other concern was the learning curve, right? It's like how easy it would be for everybody to, and for me to learn it. Um, right. And whether it had all of the features that we needed. And there are a few features that I actually discussed with um, uh, Cody at Onshape. Uh, and they were actually awesome about using their scripting uh, language in Onshape to sort of mimic some of the features of the old cat 
uh, in Onshape in a way that actually works even better than the old system. So it was it was amazing. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Philip. What, what's your experience been? Maybe you can take us through your your journey with Onshape. Sure. So we've been <clears throat> we've been using Onshape at Silverside for coming up on about four years now, and we love it. We're uh, we're very happy with it. We have a very modular product line, so. We make anything from detectors that would go into backpacks to vehicles to very large things that a shipping container would go through. And so, uh, excuse me, <laughs> on shape helps us to track and collaborate faster on the design. We can have multiple people working um, at the same time on a project. And it also helps us to figure out if somebody else comes to us and say, hey, I want something new how we can grab modules from things that we already have, put them together, and then keep track of the design development and the different branches and ideas that we have, how they all fit together um, as the design comes together. And it's just been fantastic. Uh, from a mechanical engineering background, I will also say that having uh, used a number of different systems and thought SolidWorks was the greatest thing since sliced bread before, uh, I got using Onshape and I went, wow, this is amazing. And I really don't want to design in any other platform um, after, after getting uh, only a little bit familiar with it. You know, it's funny, right? How the speed of technology progression, I was explaining to some young guns the other day how I used to have a day timer and that was my life. And if I lost that day timer, I was dead. And I don't know how we, we existed without you know, Google Maps. <laughs> so how did we get anywhere? I don't know. But, uh, but so, so Matt, you know, it, it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, some of the concerns that Raphael brought up. I, you hear, for instance, you know, all the time, wow, you know, I get my Amazon bill at the end of the month, it's, it's through the roof. And, but the reality is that, yeah, well, maybe you are doing more, but you're doing things that you couldn't have done before. And I think about your experience in, in teaching and educating, I, I mean, you, so much more limited in terms of the resources that you would have had to be able to, to educate people. So what's your experience been with, with Onshape and, and what has it enabled? Um, yeah, I, I was actually talking, before we went with Onshape, we had a previous CAD program and I was talking to my vendor about it and he let me know that we were actually one of the biggest CAD shops in the state. Because if you think about it, a really big program, you know, a really big company might employ 5, 10, 15, 20 CAD guys, right? I mean, when I worked for a large defense contractor, I think there were probably 20 of us as the CAD guys. Um, I now have about 300 students doing CAD. So there's probably more students with more hours of CAD under their belt um, in my building than there were when I worked for uh, the big defense contractor. Um, but like you mentioned, uh, probably our biggest hurdle is just resources. And so we want, we want, one of the things I've always prided myself in trying to do in this program is provide students with access to tools and skills that they're going to see either in college or in the real world. So that's one of the reasons we went with a big professional CAD program. Um, there are, you know, sort of K-12 oriented software and programs and things, but, you know, I, I want my kids coding in Python and using Slack and using professional type of tools. Um, and so when it comes to CAD, that's just, that, that was a real hurdle. I mean, you know, you could spend $30,000 on one seat of, uh, you know, professional level CAD program. And then you need a $30,000 computer to run it on if you're doing, you know, big, uh, heavy assemblies. Um, and so one of my dreams, and it was always just a crazy dream, and I would, the way I would always pitch it to my school system, I'd say someday I'm going to have a kid on a school issued Chromebook in subsidized housing on public Wi-Fi doing professional level CAD. And that's, that was a crazy statement until a couple of years ago. So we're really excited that I literally, and that, you know, March, and um, you said the forced March, uh, the forced March uh, into, you know, modernity. Um, March 13th, I had kids sitting in my engineering lab that we spent a lot of money on doing CAD. March 14th, those kids were at home on their school issue Chromebooks on public Wi-Fi, uh, keeping their designs going and collaborating. And then, yeah, I can go on and on about some of the things, you know, the features that we've learned since then that are even better. So it's not like this is some inferior or diminished version of the CAD. I mean, there's so much about it that's 
that's better. Well, than I want to I want to ask you that. I may be over my skis on this, but are we seeing? Are we starting to see the early days of the democratization of CAD and product design? It is the the citizen engineer. I mean, it may be insulting to the engineers in the room, but but is that are we beginning to see that? I have to believe that as everything moves into the cloud, part of that is democratization. That I don't need. Um, I can whether you know. I think. Uh, artists, you know, I can have a music studio in my basement with a nice enough software package and I can, I can be a professional for, well, my wife's a photographer, I'm not allowed to say that. I can be a professional <laughs> photographer with, you know, some cloud-based software. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do think that's part of the, uh, what we're seeing is as, as more and more technologies move into the cloud. Philip or Raphael, anything you'd, you'd add? I think, I mean, yeah, that, that, that combination of cloud-based CAD and then 3D printing that is becoming more and more affordable uh, and ubiquitous, it's, it's truly transformative. And I think for education, it's fantastic. I wish when I was a kid, I had uh, the opportunity to play with those kinds of things because uh, I was always building things, but, you know, the, in a very primitive way. So um, I think this is a dream for kids to, to be able to do this. And... Um, yeah, there's so many other technologies coming on like Arduino and all of these electronic things that let kids play at home very cheaply with things that back in my day would have been unthinkable. So we know there's a, go ahead, Philip, uh, please. We had a pandemic and Silverside moved to a new manufacturing facility this year. I was just on the shop floor talking with contractors standing six feet apart, pointing at things. Uh, but through it all, our CAD system was completely unruffled. Nothing stopped in our development work. Nothing stopped in our support for existing systems in the field. We didn't have to think about it. We had other server issues, but none uh, with our you know, engineering CAD platform and product development and support rolled right ahead, uh, which was cool. Could also say to, oh, go ahead. No, kind of. to Matt's point, I think it's just really cool what you're doing with the kids. Um, the most interesting uh, secondary and college level engineering work that I did was project based. Pick an important problem to the world, go solve it. And that is what we do here. That is what my entire career has been. And I'm super excited to see, see what uh, your students are going to be doing uh, in their home classrooms on their Chromebooks now and, and what they do building on that. Yeah, I so agree. I, I'm super excited to see your kids coming out of college with engineering degrees. Um, because I, yeah, I think that project-based experience is so much better than uh, just sitting in a classroom taking notes and doing math problems. Oh, um, absolutely. And I, and I think it will give the kids a much better flavor of what engineering is really about. I think a lot of kids get turned off by engineering because they think it's kind of dry because it's just about the math or some very abstract, abstract concepts. And they are there, but I think the most important thing is just that hands-on uh, building and the creativity of, of making things that you can touch, that you can see, that you can see functioning. Great. So, uh, you know, we all know the relentless pace of technology progression. So when you think about, when you're sitting down with the folks at Onshape and they're at the customer advisory board, what are the things that, that you want Onshape to do that it doesn't do today? I I could start by saying I just love some of the things it does do because it's such a modern platform. And I think some of these, uh, some, some platforms that have, a, that have a lot of legacy and a lot of history behind them, I think we're dragging some of that behind them. So it's cool to see a platform that seemed to be developed in a modern era. And so that's, you know, it is the Google Docs. And so the fact that collaboration and versioning and link sharing is and, and like platform agnostic uh, abilities, the fact that that seems to be just built into the, the nature of the thing, so far that's super exciting. As far as things that it, uh, to go from there, um, I don't know, I'll let the other Other guys than talk. price, you can't, say, you can't say lower price. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so far on chain, uh, PTC's worked with us really well, so I'm not complaining there either. Great, yeah. Yeah, no gaps, guys. White space, come on. Let's, uh, we, let's, uh, uh, we've been really enjoying the, the three-week update cadence. You know, there's a new version every three weeks, and we don't have to install it. We just get all the latest and greatest goodies. Um, one of the trends that we've been following and enjoying is the, the help with uh, revision management and release workflows. 
Um, and I know that there's more that Onshape is working on that we're very excited for, because that's a big important part about making real hardware and supporting it in the field. Um, something that was cool, they just integrated some markup capability in the last release that took, we were doing that anyway, but we were doing it outside of Onshape. So now we get to streamline our workflow and put it in the CAD system where we're making those changes anyway, when we're reviewing drawings and doing this kind of collaboration. And so I think from our perspective, we continue to look forward to, to further progress on that. There's a lot of capability in the cloud that I think they're just kind of scratching the surface on yet. Right. I, I would, I, I mean, you're, you're asking to nitpick. Um, I would say one of the things that I would like to see is, is faster regeneration speed. There are a few times with complex assemblies that regenerating the document takes a little longer than I would like to. Okay. It's not a serious issue, but anyway, I'm, I, I'm being spoiled. By yeah, no, I, I, that's that, good. Right? I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I, I like to ask that question of practitioners. And, and to me, it, it's a signal, like when you're nitpicking and that's when you're struggling to nitpick, that to me is a sign of a successful product. And, and I wonder, I, I don't know, uh, I have to deep in, dive into the architecture, but are things like alternative processors, you're seeing them hit the market in a, in a big way, uh, you know, maybe it's helping address the, that challenge. But um, I'm going to ask you the big chewy question now, uh, and then we'll maybe go to some audience questions. When you think about the world's biggest problems, I mean, we're just with global pandemics, obviously top of mind, you think about nutrition, you know, feeding the global community. We've actually done a pretty good job of that, but it's not necessarily with the greatest nutrition, climate change, uh, alternative energy, the economic divides, you've got geopolitical threats and social unrest, healthcare is a continuing problem. What's your vision uh, for changing the world and how product innovation for good can be applied to some, some of the, the, the problems that, that you all are, are passionate about? Big question, who wants to start? That? I'm biased, but for years I've been saying that if you want to solve the economy, the environment, uh, global unrest, pandemics, education is the key. So if you want to, if you want uh, to um, make progress in those, in those realms, I think funding, funding education is probably going to pay off pretty well. Absolutely. And I think STEM is key to that. I mean, all of the, a lot of the well-being that we have today in, in industrialized countries is thanks to science and technology, right? Improvements in healthcare, improvements in communication, transportation, air conditioning. Um, every aspect of life is touched by science and technology. So I think having more kids studying and understanding that is absolutely key. Yeah. Totally agree. Philip, you got anything to add? Well, I think there are some big technical problems uh, in the world today. Raphael and ourselves are certainly working on a couple of them. I think there are also collaboration problems and getting everybody to be able to pull together instead of pull, pulling separately and to be able to spur the ideas onward. So that's where I think the education side is really exciting what Matt is doing. And, and it, this kind of collaboration uh, in general, when we can do it provide tools to help people do good work. Uh, that is, I think, valuable. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point. And along those lines, we have some projects that are about creating uh, very low cost instruments for low research settings, uh, places in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, so that they can do um, um, biomedical research that it's difficult to do in those places because they don't have the money to buy the fancy lab machines that cost $30,000 an app. Um, so we're trying to sort of democratize some of those instruments. And I think thanks to tools like Onshape, then it's easier, for example, to have a conversation with somebody in Africa and show them the design that we have and discuss the details of it with them. Um, and that's amazing, right? To have somebody in a, you know, 10 time zones away um, looking real life in real time with you about your design and discussing the details or teaching them how to build a machine, right? Because um, you know, if they have a 3D printer, you can you can just give them the design and say like you build it yourself, uh, even cheaper than, than than you know us building it and shipping it there. Um, so all that that um, that aspect of it is also so super important, I think, for any of these efforts to improve um, some of the hardest problems in the world, from climate change to you say as you say poverty, nutrition issues, um, you know availability of water. 
you have that project matter about finding water. Um, if we can also help deploy technologies and teach people remotely how to create their own technologies or how to build their own systems that will help them solve those problems locally. I think that's very powerful. Yeah, the point about education is right on. I, I think some people in the audience may be familiar with the work of Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee, the second machine age where they sort of put forth the premise that uh, hey, they laid it out. Look, the, 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 for the first time in history, machines are, are replacing humans from a cognitive perspective. Machines have always replaced humans, but that's going to have an impact on jobs. But the answer is not to protect the past from the future. Uh, the answer is education and public policy that really supports that. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a really you know, great point. Um, we, ha we do have some, some questions from the audience, if, if, we can, if, if I can ask you guys. Um, you know, this one kind of stands out. Um, how do you see uh, artificial intelligence? I was just talking about machine intelligence. Um, how do you see that impacting the design space? You guys trying to infuse AI into your product development? Uh, what can you tell me? Uh, absolutely. Like we are using AI for some uh, things, including some of these very low cost instruments that will uh, hopefully help us diagnose certain diseases, especially diseases that are very prevalent in the third world. Um, and some of those diagnostics are these days done by uh, um, these armies of technicians that um, are trained to look under the microscope. but um, that's a very slow process, it's very error prone and having machine learning systems that can do the same diagnosis faster uh, and cheaper and also little machines that can be taken to very remote places uh, to these villages that have no access to a fancy microscope to look at a sample from a patient, that's very powerful. And I, we don't do this, but I have read quite a bit about uh, how, how uh, certain uh, pl places are using artificial intelligence to actually help them optimize designs for parts. So you get these very interesting looking parts that uh, you would have never thought of, um, a person would have never thought of, but uh, that um, are incredibly light, incredibly strong, and I have all sorts of properties that are very interesting thanks to uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in particular. Yet another uh, advantage you get when, when your work is in the cloud, um, I've seen, I mean, there's just so many applications to that. So if the radiology scan is in the cloud and the radiologist is goes to bed at night, the radiologist could come in in the morning and say, oh, the machine while you were sleeping was using artificial intelligence to scan these 40,000 images. And here's the five that we picked out that we think you should take a closer look at. Or like Raphael said, um, I can design my part, my, 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 my you know, mount or bracket or whatever and go to sleep and then I wake up in the morning and the machine has improved it for me has made it strider strider stronger and lighter um, and so just when you when your work is in the cloud that's just such a really cool advantage that you get that you can have machines doing some of your design work for you yeah we've been watching um, you know this week is this month I guess is AWS reinvent and it's just amazing to see how much effort is coming around you know, machine learning, machine intelligence. You know, Amazon has SageMaker, Google's got you know, embedded you know, ML and BigQuery, uh, certainly Microsoft with Azure is doing tons of stuff in, in machine learning. I think the point there is that, that these things will be infused into R&D and into uh, to software products by the, the vendor community. And then you all will apply that to your business and, and build value through the unique data that you're collecting you know, in your ecosystems. And, and that's how you add value. You don't have to be necessarily you know, developers of artificial intelligence, but you have to be practitioners to apply that. Does that make sense to you, uh, Philip? Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about value is really well chosen. We see AI involved from the physics simulations all the way up to interpreting radiation data. And that's where the value question I think is really important because it's, is the output of the AI giving helpful information to the people that need to be looking at it? So if it's curating a series of radiation alerts saying, hey, like these are the anomalies you need to look at, uh, is it doing that in a way that's gonna help a good response? Uh, and in some cases, the AI, AI is only as good as the people that sort of gave it a direction and turn it loose. And you wanna make sure that you don't have biases or things like that underlying your AI that are gonna result in, uh, in less than helpful outcomes coming from it. 
So we spend yeah. actually quite a lot of time thinking about how do we provide the right outcomes uh, to people who are who are relying on our systems. I mean, that's a great point, right? Humans are biased and humans build models. So models are inherently biased, but then the software is, is hitting the market that's going to help us identify those biases and, and help us, you know, course correct. So it's a, we're entering some, some very exciting times. Guys, great conversation. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us and sharing with our audience the innovations that, that you're bringing uh, to help the world. So thanks again. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, when we come back, John McElhaney is going to join me. Uh, he's an Onshape co-founder and he's currently the VP of strategy at PTC. He's going to join the program. We're going to take a look at what's next in product innovation. I'm Dave Vellante and you're watching Innovation for Good on theCUBE, the global leader in digital technology event coverage. We'll be right back. the globe. It's the Cube presenting Innovation for Good. Brought to you by Onshape. Okay, welcome back to Innovation for Good. With me is John McElhaney, who is one of the co-founders of Onshape and is now the VP of Strategy at PTC. John, it's good to see you. Thanks for making the time to come on the program. Thanks, Dave. So we heard earlier some of the accomplishments that, that you've made since the acquisition. Uh, how, how has the acquisition affected your strategy, maybe you could talk about what resources PTC brought to the table that, that allowed you to sort of rethink or evolve your strategy. What can you share with us? Sure, you know, a year ago when, when John and myself met with Jim Heppelman early on as we were, we were pondering sort of joining PTC, uh, one of the things that became very clear is that we had a, a, a very clear shared vision about how we could take the Onshape platform and really extend it for, for all of the, the PTC products, particular sort of their uh, augmented reality, as well as their, their thing works or the IOT business and their product. And so from the very beginning, there was a clear strategy about taking on shape, extending the platform and, and really investing um, pretty significantly on the product development as well as go to market side of things uh, to, to bring on shape out to 
not only the PTC base, but sort of the broader community at large. So, so, um, so PTC has been a terrific, terrific um, sort of partner as we've, we've done a, gone after this market together. Uh, so we've added a, a lot of resource in the product development side of things, a lot of resource in the go-to-market and customer success and support. So really on many fronts, it's, it's both resources as well as sort of support at the corporate level from, from a strategic standpoint. And then in the field, we've had wonderful uh, interactions with many large uh, enterprise customers as well as the BTC channel. So it's been really a great, uh, a great year. Well, and you think about the, the challenges of, of in your business go, going to SaaS, which you guys, you know, took on that journey, you know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, it, it's not trivial for a lot of companies to make that transition, especially a company that's been around as long as PTC. So, so I, I'm wondering how much, you know, I was just asking you how much what PC, PTC brought to the table. I got to believe you're bringing a lot to the table too, in terms of the mindset, uh, may, may, even things as, as uh, mundane is not the right word, but things like how you compensate salespeople, how you interact with customers, the, the notion of, of, of a service versus a product. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really great point. In fact, after we had met Jim last year, John and I, one of the things we walked out in the Seaport area in Boston, and one of the things we sort of said is, you know, Jim really gets what we're trying to do here. And, and part of, let me bring you into the, the thinking early on, part of what Jim talked about is there's lots of, um, you know, install base sort of software that's inside of the PTC base that's helped literally thousands of customers around the world. But the idea of moving to SaaS and all that it entails, both from a technology standpoint, but also a cultural standpoint, like how do you, not, not just compensate the salespeople as an example, but how do you think about customer success? In the past, it might've been that you had professional services that you bring out to a customer and help them deploy your solutions. Well, when you're thinking about a SaaS-based offering, it's really critical that you get customer successful with it. Otherwise, you may have churn and, and you know you, it, it, it'll be very expensive in terms of your business long-term. So you've got to get customers successful with the software in the very beginning. So it, you know, Jim, really looked at Onshape and he said to John and I, from a cultural standpoint, you know, a lot of times companies get acquired and, and they've acquired technology in the past that they integrate directly into, into PTC and then sort of roll it out through their products or, or their, their distribution channel. He said, in some respects, John and John, think about it as we're going to take PTC and we want to integrate it into Onshape <laughs> because we want you to share with us both on the sales side and customer success on marketing, on operations, you know, all the things, because long-term we believe the world is a SaaS world that the whole industry is going to move to. So really it was sort of an in, in inverse in terms of the thought process related to normal transactions. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. You mentioned churn, churn's the si silent killer of a SaaS company. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion, you know, in the entrepreneurial community, of course you live this, you know, what's the best path? I mean, today you see, you know, you, you watch Silicon Valley, double, double, triple, triple, uh, but but there's a lot of people who believe, and I wonder if you comment this. The best path to you know in the X Y axis, if, if it's if it's uh, you know growth on one and retention on the other axis, what's the best way to get to the upper right? Uh, and, and really, the 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 best path is probably to make sure you've nailed obviously the product market fit, but make sure that you can retain customers and then throw gas in the fire. You see a lot of companies. They burn out trying to grow too fast, yeah. but they haven't figured out, you know, that, but there's too much churn. They haven't figured out those metrics. I mean, obviously on shape, you know, you were sort of a pioneer in here. I got to believe you figured out that customer retention before you really, you know, put your, the pedal to the metal. Yeah. But. Yeah. And, you know, growth, uh, growth can mask a lot of things, uh, but getting, getting customers, you know, especially in the engineering space, nobody goes and sits there and says, Tomorrow we're going to go and 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 you know put a hundred users on this and and immediately swap out all of our existing tools. These tools are very rich and deep in terms of capability, and they become part of the operational process of how a company designs and builds products. So anytime anybody's actually going through the purchasing process, typically they will run a trial or they'll run a project where they they look at kind of what what is this new solution going to help them do. How are we going to orient ourselves for success longer term? So for us, you know, getting new customers and customer acquisition is really critical. 
but getting those customers to actually deploy the solution and be successful with it. You know, we like to sort of say the, the marketing or the lead generation and even some of the initial sales, that's sort of like the kindling, but the fire really starts when customers deploy it and get successful with the solution because they bring other customers into the fold. And then of course, if they're successful with it, you know, then in fact, you'll have negative churn, which ironically means growth in terms of your, inside of your install base. Right, and you've seen that with some of the, the emerging you know, SaaS companies where you're, you're actually, you know, when you calculate whatever it's net retention or renewals, it's actually from a dollar standpoint, it's up in the high 90s or even over 100%. So, right. and that's a, a trend we're going to continue to see. I wonder if we could sort of go back uh, and, and when you guys were starting on shape, some of the things that you saw that you were trying to strategically leverage and what's changed you know, today, you know, we were talking, I was talking to John earlier about, you yeah. know, in a way, you kind of, you, you kind of got a blank slate again. It's like doing another startup, right. know, not obviously you got install base and customers to service, but, but it's a new beginning for you guys. So what are the things that you saw then, you know, cloud and, and SaaS and, and okay, but that's, we've been there, done that. What are you seeing, you know, today? Well, you know, so, so this is a journey, of course, that uh, that Onshape on its own has gone through and had, I'll sort of say, you know, several iterations, both in terms of of uh, of you know how do you how do you get customers, how do you how do you get them successful, how do you grow those customers, and now that we've been part of PTC, the question becomes, okay, one, there's certainly a higher level of credibility that helps us in terms of our, our megaphone is much bigger than it was when we were a standalone company. But on top of that, now figuring out how to work with their channel, with their direct sales force, you know, they have, um, for example, you know, very large enterprises. Well, many of those customers are not going to go and forklift out their existing solution and replace it with, with Onshape. However, many of them do have challenges in their supply chain and communications with contractors and vendors across the globe. And so, you know, finding our fit inside of those large enterprises as they extend out with, with their, their customers is, is a very interesting area that we've really been um, sort of incremental to, to PTC. And then, um, you know, they, they have access to lots of other technology like the IoT business. And now, of course, the augmented reality business that, that we can bring things to bear. For example, in the augmented reality world, they've, they've got something called expert capture. And this is essentially imagine, you know, an AR a headset that allows you to be able to, to speak to it, but also capture images, still images in video. And you can take somebody who's doing their task and capture literally the steps that they're taking, it's geolocation, and, and from there build steps for new employees to be able to learn and, and understand how to, how, to, how to use that technology to help them do their job better. Well, when they do that, if there's replacement products or variation of, of uh, some of the tools that that they built the original design instruction set for, they now have another version. Well, they have to manage multiple versions. Well, that's what Onshape is really great at doing. And so taking our technology and helping their solutions as well. So it's not only expanding our customer footprint, it's expanding the application footprint in terms of how we can help them and help customers. So that leads me to the TAM discussion. And again, as part of your strategist role, uh, how do you think about that? I was just talking to some of your customers earlier about the democratization of, of CAD and, and engineering. You know, I kind of joked sort of like citizen engineering, uh, yeah. but, but so that, you know, the demographics are, are changing, um, the, the number of users potentially that can access the products because the, it's so much more of a facile experience. How, how are you thinking about the total available market? It, it really is a great question. You know, it used to be when you, when you sold boxes of software, it was how many engineers are out there and that's the size of the market. The fact that matter is now when, when you think about access to that, that information and that data is simply a pane of glass, whether it's a computer, whether it's a laptop, uh, a, a cell phone, or whether it's a tablet, the, the ability to, to use different vehicles to access information and data expands the capabilities and power of a system to allow feedback and iteration. I mean, one of the, one of the very interesting things is uh, in technology, is when you can take something and really unleash it to a larger audience and build you know, purpose-built applications, you can start to iterate and get better feedback. You know, there's the, the classic case in the clothing industry where Zara you know, is a fast sort of turnaround, uh, agile manufacturer. 
And there was a great New York Times uh, article written a couple of years ago. My wife's a, a fan of Zara. And I think she justifies any purchases by saying, you know, with Zara, you got to purchase it now. Otherwise, it may not be there the next time you, you, you go back to the store. They, they had some people in a store in New York that had this women's throw kind of covering shawl. And they said, well, it would be great if we could have this little clip here so we can hook it through or something. And they sent a note back to, to the factory in Spain. And literally two weeks later, they had, you know, 4,000 of these things in the store and they sold out because they had a closed loop and iterative process. And so if we can take information and allow people to access it multiple ways through different devices and different screens, that can be very specific information that, you know, we remove a lot of the engineering data, but bring the end user product conceptually to somebody that would have had to wait months to get the actual physical prototype and we can get feedback. Well, we can have a better chance at making sure whatever product we're building is the right product when it ultimately gets delivered to a customer. Yes. So it's really, it's a much larger market that has to be thought of rather than just the kind of selling a box of software to an engineer. Now, that's a great story. And, and again, it's gotta be exciting for you guys to see that and, and with the added resources that you have at PTC. Um, so let's talk, I promised people we were going to talk about Atlas. Let's talk about the platform a little bit. Atlas was announced last year. Atlas, for those who don't know, it's a SaaS based platform. It purports to go beyond product lifecycle management. And you, you're talking cloud-like agility and scale to CAD and product design. But, but John, you could do a better job than I. What do we need to know <laughs> about Atlas? Well, I think Atlas is a great description because it really is metaphorically sort of holding up all of the PTC applications themselves. But from the very beginning, when John and I met with Jim, part of what we were intrigued about was that he shared a vision that Onshape was more than just going to be a, a CAD authoring tool. That in fact, you know, in the past, these, these engineering tools were very powerful, but they were very narrow in their purpose and focus. And we had specialty applications to manage the versions, et cetera. What we did in Onshape is we kind of inverted that thinking. We built this collaboration and sharing engine at the core and then kind of wrapped the CAD system around it. But that collaboration, sharing and versioning engine is really powerful. And it was that vision that Jim had that he shared that we had from the beginning, which was how do we take this thing and make a platform that can be used for many other applications inside of, inside of any company? And so not only do we have a partner um, application area that is, is much like the App Store or the Google Play Store, uh, that was sort of our first instantiation of this, this, this platform. But now we're extending out to broader applications and, and much meatier applications. And internally, that's the thing works in the, in the augmented reality. But there'll be other applications that ultimately find its way on top of this platform. And so they'll get all the benefits of, of the collaboration, the sharing, the versioning, the multi-platform, you know, multi-device. And that's an extremely, extremely um, uh, strategic leverage point for the company. You know, it's interesting, John, you mentioned the seaport before. So PTC, for those who don't know, built a beautiful facility down at the seaport uh, in Boston. And of course, the, when PTC started, you know, back in the mid 1980s, this, there was nothing at the seaport. Uh, so right. it's kind of, kind of ironic, you know, we, we've, we're see, we, we've seen the transformation of the seaport, we're seeing the transformation of industry and of course PTC, and I'm sure someday you'll get back into that beautiful office, you know, full- Can't full wait. <laughs> but yeah, I'll bet. And, uh, and, and, but I want to, I bring this up because I, I, want, I want you to talk about the future, how you, how you see that our, our industry, and you've observed this has moved from very product centric to, to plat, platform centric with, with SaaS and cloud. And now we're seeing ecosystems form around those products and platforms and, and data flowing through the ecosystem, powering you know, new innovation. I, I wonder if you could paint a picture for us of what the future looks like to you from your vantage point. Yeah, I think one of the key words you said there is data, because up until now, data for companies really was sort of trapped in different applications. And it wasn't because people were nefarious and they wanted to keep it limited. It was just the way in which things were built. And, you know, when people use an application like Onshape, what ends up happening is their their day to day interaction and everything that they do is actually captured by the platform. And you know we don't have access to that data. Of course, it's it's the customer's data, but as a, as an artifact of them using the system and doing their day to day job, what's happening is they're creating huge amounts of information that can then be accessed and analyzed to help them both improve their design process, improve 
their efficiencies, improve their actual schedules in terms of making sure they can hit delivery times and be able to understand where there might be roadblocks in the future. So the way I see it is companies now are deploying SaaS-based tools like Onshape. And an artifact of them using that platform is that they have now analytics and tools to better understand and, and instrument and manage their business. And then from there, I think you're going to see because these systems are all, you know, extremely well architected and allow through, you know, very structured API calls to connect other SaaS based applications, you're going to start seeing closed loop sort of systems. So for example, people design using Onshape, they end up going and deploying their system or installing it or people use the end using products. People then may call back into the customer's support line and report issues, problems, challenges. They'll be able to do traceability back to the underlying design. They'll be able to do trend analysis and defect analysis from the support lines and tie it back and close loop the product design, manufacturer deployment in the field sort of cycles. In addition, you can imagine there's many things that are sort of as designed, but then when people go on site and they have to install it, there's some alterations, modifications. Think about, think about like uh, large air conditioning units for buildings. You go and, and you go to train and you get a large air conditioning unit that's put up on top of a building with a crane. They have to build all kinds of adapters to make sure that that will fit inside of, of, of the particulars of that building. You know, with Onshape and tools like this, you'll be able to not only take the design of what the air conditioning system might be, but also the all the adapter plates, but also how they installed it. So it's sort of as designed, as manufactured, and as installed. And all these things can be traced. Just like if you think about the transformation of customer service or customer contacts, in the early days, you used to have tools that were PC-based tools called contact management solutions, you know, kind of ACT or Goldmine. And these were basically glorified electronic Rolodexes. Right. It had customer names and they had phone numbers and whatever else. And Salesforce and Siebel, you know, these types of systems really uh, broadened out the perspective of what a customer relationship was. So it wasn't just the contact information. It was, you know, how did they come to find out about you as a company? So all the pre sort of marketing and then kind of what happens after they become a customer. And it really was a 360 view. I think that 360 view gets extended to not just who the customer is, but also the tools and the and and um, the products they use, and then of course the performance information that can come back to the manufacturer. So you know, as an engineer, one of the things you learn about with systems is the following. And if you remember when the CD first came out, uh, CDs they used to talk about four times oversampling or eight times oversampling, and it was really right. kind of you know the fidelity of the system, and and we know from systems theory that the best way to improve the performance of a system is to actually have more feedback. The more feedback you have, the better a system can be. And so that's why you get 16, 64X sampling, et cetera. Same thing here. The more feedback we have of different parts of a company, the better performance the company will be, better customer relationships, better uh, overall financial performance as well. So that's the, that's the view I have of how these systems all tie together. It's a great vision and your point about the, da the data is I think right on it used to be so fragmented in silos and in order to take a system view, you've got to have a system view of the data. It's not, I mean, for, for years we've optimized maybe on one little component of the system and, and that sometimes we lose sight of the overall outcome. And so what you just described, I think is, I think sets up you know, very well as we exit, hopefully soon we exit this, this COVID era. Uh, and John, I hope that you, know, you and I can sit down face to face at a, at a PTC on shape event uh, in the near in, term. It was, in the seaport. <laughs> in the seaport would be, be, I tell you, that'd be a great facility to have a, have an event for sure. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Down there. So, so John McElhaney, thanks so much for, for participating in the program. It was really great to have you on. Great, thanks Dave. Okay, and I want to thank everyone for participating today. We had some great guest speakers. And remember, this was a live program. So give us a little bit of time. We're going to flip this site over to on-demand mode so you can share it with your colleagues and you, or you can come back and, and watch the sessions that you heard today. Uh, this is Dave Vellante for theCUBE and Onshape PTC. Thank you so much for watching Innovation for Good. Be well, have a great holiday, and we'll see you next time.